Good morning. It's June 6th, and we'd like to welcome you to Charlie Lake Community Church. Uh, it's hard to believe we're into June already, isn't it? Those days are so long in the sunlight, and we've had an absolutely gorgeous week. Uh, as I record this, it sounds like we might have a little bit of rain on Sunday, perhaps, but uh, on, on Thursday as I record, this is absolutely gorgeous outside, and so we're so thankful for that. And we'd like to thank you for, for uh, joining us in our online service, and we have a a full time together, we are going to look at the Word of God. We're looking at Second Kings 17 this morning. We're going to hear uh, from Kimberly Grant with our scripture reading, and we are going to have our worship with the Hub family. And so we, we are just so happy and, and uh, thrilled that you can join us. And as we enter into this time of worship, I would just invite you to pray along with me as we get started. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we can come here and be here in your name. Father, in this time ahead, as we sing, as we read your word, as we study your word, I pray that we would be honored to you and you alone. Father, I thank you for this place. I thank you uh, for the wonderful week we've had. And Father, as we gather, let us just re remember uh, your great love and your great mercy for each and every one of us. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's have our worship time, and we will uh, then follow that with our scripture reading, and then we'll gather back here.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, In your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in place of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as ransom for many. Back to you, Josh. Before we get into the message, I just want to lead us in a prayer time. And of course, we want to continue to remember the Preston family with uh, Margaret's passing just a week ago. And I know many of you were able to take uh, and watch the online live stream of her uh, funeral service uh, from Summerland. And we are, we're thankful that uh, technology is such that uh, that everybody was able to do that. And so as the family continues to mourn, we want to lift them up uh, in our prayers as well. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this time. I thank you for this place. Uh, Father, we want to bring the Preston family to you today, and we just pray for all of Margaret's family that you will continue to be lifting them up, that you will continue to be guiding them and uh, giving them a sense of the peace that only you can give. Uh, Father, we're thankful and we give thanks for the technology that allowed so many people to be able to watch her live stream <coughs> and to enjoy uh, remembering her and, and giving thanks for her life. And so, Father, we can pray that in these days to come, as, as things get back to whatever normal is going to look like uh, for the Preston family, that you will be with them, that they will be uh, turned to you in their time of grief. Uh, Father, we thank you as well just for this past week and, and for the many that uh, have been able to just enjoy this weather and enjoy uh, time outside and enjoy some time with family. And uh, Father, we are thinking still of Tim and Tammy, and as Tim waits for his heart, we just pray that you'll continue to give them patience, uh, continue to be with the doctors as they do all the, the pre-checks and everything that needs to be done, and uh, continue to be with them. And we bring Jake to you as well, and as he still waits for his appointment, we just know, Father, that your timing will be perfect, and we know it feels like a long time, and we know it feels like um, this is kind of a never-ending wait for an appointment, but we know that that day will come. But we just pray for patience and that you will be with Kim and Jake as well. Father, we thank you so much uh, for Angel, and we just pray that as she continues to struggle and battle with her health, that you will lift her up, give her the strength she needs, give the doctors wisdom as they uh, try to figure everything out as well. And so, Father, as we go into your word, it's, it's a heavier message today, but I just pray that as we go through it, that you will be honored uh, despite the heaviness of it, and that we uh, will be spurred on to turn our hearts to you. So I thank you for this time ahead, and we give it to you. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, as we enter into our next week of our sermon series looking at redemption, uh, today's message is a little bit on the darker side. Usually we have been able to give some hope and bring some uh, some expectancy for uh, what can move forward with some of these, these the sins of a nation and sins of the people. Today we're going to kind of leave you hanging because in the next number of weeks we're going to start to rebuild uh, the nation as it gets to a place where, uh, as it gets to a place where it realizes that it has left God behind. And in just a couple of weeks we're actually going to be into the New Testament part of redemption, and we've only got about four more weeks of the. Redemption, redemption series to go, and so we've been excited to go through this. Uh, but today I've titled our message, Captives to Sin, Captives to Kings. You see, the nation of Israel at some point gave in to sin. They decided that they were not going to care anymore about serving God. They decided that they would serve God only as long as it made sense and as it was necessary and if it benefited them. And the biggest problem of all that we've found in the last three weeks is the fact that oftentimes it was the kings who set the example, the leader of the nation set the example of, 
uh, turning their heart, turning their backs on God. And so today we get to the, the, the point in the Bible where there is some severe consequences for that. And we often talk about being careful of prophets, being careful of teachers that are nothing more than, than, than wolves in sheep's clothing. And I think many of the leaders of Israel were just such people. Uh, we had kings who were saying one thing about God and yet living a whole other way. And when we left off with King Solomon last week, we left off um, at a point where he had given in to all the ways of this world. Now what happened after that is king after king after king came along and everything kind of stayed the same. Now we have some warnings in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. It says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. First John 4 reminds us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't listen to everything you read. Rather, it's the scriptures, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into this world. Now, if that wasn't enough, in Matthew, we are warned that be beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Now, our world is full of false teachers, false prophets, and we need to be aware. Now, what happened in Israel was it was their leaders who were being the false prophets, the false leaders, the false teachers. And like I said, king after king in the Old Testament history goes by. And over and over and over again, we read, for the most part, almost 100% of the time, they followed in the, that they, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, they followed in the ways of the world rather than in the ways of God. Now, when we read they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, when we first hear that, we think, you know, they sinned a little bit, they turned their hearts a little bit. But did you know the definition of evil is profoundly immoral and wicked? Profoundly immoral and wicked. I want you to think about that for a second. Because oftentimes we like to think, you know what, I, I, I struggle with some sin in my life. I have had some sins in my life that I'm not proud of. But I wonder how it would change our, our frame of mind if we understood how God views them. That he sees our sins as profoundly immoral and wicked. I think if we let that sink in for a second, it would change in many ways how we interact. How we decide uh, what we should or shouldn't do. What is right, what is wrong. But far too often in our world and in the time of the Old Testament, in the time of the New Testament, even in current day, far too often we fall into this trap of saying, you know what, everybody else is doing it. Why not me? And we have taken off that idea that, that, that sin is evil, it's immoral, it's, it's something that is absolutely disgusting to God. So let's jump in. We're going to read from 2 Kings 17 this morning. So if you have your Bibles at home, I'd encourage you to, to be following along as well. And I have a, quite a lengthy passage here to read, so we're going to just jump right in and read uh, a large chunk of it. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became the king of Israel in Samaria. And he reigned nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. Shalmaneser... Shalmanzer, king of Assyria, came up and attacked Hoshea, uh, who had been Shalmanzer's vassal and had paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hoshea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt, and he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, Shalmanzer uh, seized him and put him to, into prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of, Israel, uh, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, the Gozon on the Habor River, and in the towns of the Medes. 
All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the king, kings of Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. Think about that. Every high hill, every spreading tree, they were erecting idols. At every high place they burned incense, as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshipped idols, though the Lord had said, You shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah uh, through all his prophets and seers, Turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey, and that I delivered to you through my servants the prophets. But they would not listen, and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord and Lord their God, and made themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an Asherah pole. They bowed down to the starry host, and they worshipped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left, and even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices Israel had introduced. Therefore, the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted them and gave them into the hands of plunderers until he thrust them from his presence. Now, this is a sobering passage of Scripture, is it not? This is a nation that was serving the living God. He had brought them out of Egypt. He had been with them through all of the trials in the desert, through the wanderings. He had brought them across the Jordan. He had given them a king when they complained about that. And every step of the way, the nation turned its back on them, on him. And I want you to think about that for a moment. They saw God at work. They saw his mighty hand moving throughout the nation. And they still turned their backs on him. Now, it's sobering. In verse 17, they sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. They were serving a loving, merciful, graceful God, and rather than embrace that, rather than serve him and him alone, they were literally sacrificing their own children. And we can see how quickly our minds can change, how uh, easily Satan can come and, and, and mess up our way of thinking. And the choice is ours. We get to decide, I will follow God or I will turn my back on God. And the nation had fallen in to idol worship to the place where every high hill had an idol. Every tree that spread out had an idol. They had gone completely backwards from what God had said. Now, we do get a little sense because it says that we get the sense that they were still worshiping God. But they brought all these other things in and they manipulated and they changed everything around. And in their minds, they're thinking, well, we're still worshiping God. But we're also worshiping just a few others as well. And in their hearts, in their minds, because their hearts had turned from God, they couldn't see, because they were so blind, the ineptitude of their thinking, the, the, the hollowness of their hearts. What is idolatry? Because I think it's alive and it's rampant in our society today. We may not have God set up on the high hills and under the, 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 the trees that are spread out, but I guess that each of you can think of things that are in our society, in our life, 
that have become idols to us as Westerners. Idolatry is extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. We can make an idol of a person. We can lift somebody up on a pedestal so high that we begin to just wait on every single one of their words and actually, in, in, in some essence, begin to worship them. An idol can be something that consumes you, that overtakes your love for God. An idol can be something that pulls you away from your worship of God. I wonder what that looks like. I wonder how often we miss out on worshiping God at church because of something else. And I'm not saying that, 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 that that's wrong. Every once in a while we leave, we have vacations, we have times as families. But I wonder how often that pull keeps us away from gathering together and corporately worshiping God. An idol can be something that distracts. My goodness, on my drive, uh, this is my third time out here today as we're recording this, and every time I drive, there's so many cars, there's so many different distractions, and I, I can be thinking um, about what I'm going to say during this time, and then my mind wanders all over the place, and I see a car, and I see a truck, and I think, oh, that looks like so-and-so's vehicle. Our minds can be just absolutely just moved back and forth in all directions and distract us. And it's like saying, God, you're good, but you're not good enough. It's like saying, God, you have provided. I feel comfortable in my life and I enjoy my life, but I want more. You're still not good enough. In the NIV commentary, it says, this was the adoption of foreign practices introduced into the worship of Yahweh or God. The erection of stone pillars and Asherah uh, poles are also examples of this. The wooden poles or trees of Asherah were symbols of the Canaanite fertility goddess of the, of the same name. Her worship was particularly attractive to women. I wonder how often we get pulled away by the things of this world. I wonder, as you sit at home this morning... If you can think through some of those things, what are the things that pull me away from a righteous, holy walk with God? We're going to skip forward to verse 34. It says, To this day they persist in their former practices. Stubborn. Stubborn, stubborn, stubborn. They lose their land, they lose their homes, they're living in captivity. And to this day, they persist in their former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor adhere to the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands that the Lord gave the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. When the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, he commanded them, do not worship any other gods or bow down to them, serve them or sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt with mighty power and outstretched arm is the one you must worship. To him you shall bow down and to him offer sacrifices. You must always be careful to keep the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands he wrote for you. Do not worship other gods. Do not forget the covenant I have made with you and do not worship other gods. Are you hearing the theme here? Rather, worship the Lord your God. It is he who will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. The plan seems pretty simple. And I'm going to lay it out, the plan as, as it's written in Scripture. And I think, and I don't think, I know it's still in effect today. Do not worship or bow down to other gods. Our God is is the God, Jehovah, Yahweh, who created this world, the one we gather together and sing about, the one that we gather with raised hands in adoration, the one that we read his words in the scriptures. We don't bow down. We don't make any other gods before him. He is the only one to be worshipped. Do not serve or sacrifice to other gods. Now, we don't sacrifice. We don't have animal sacrifices or anything like that in our society today. 
But I wonder what other things we sacrifice. I wonder what things, because we put other things, other beliefs, other, other uh, joys in our life ahead of God sometimes, if we're sacrificing and we're missing out on such a full relationship with him. Do not bow down to other gods. Do not serve or sacrifice to other gods. Be careful to keep the decrees and regulations, the laws and the commands. We don't like to be told what to do, do we? You just try to tell somebody what to do, and you will hear about it from almost anybody. Don't tell me what to do. And yet, and, and, and I wonder if the Israelites, that was their struggle. Don't tell us what to do. Don't, don't say that we have to keep the decrees and follow the, the regulations of God, the laws and the commands of God. We're here, we're comfortable, let us do our own thing. You know, the laws of God aren't easy to follow. There's no sugarcoating that. There's no way that we can righteously walk day in and day out without falling and stumbling and sinning. The bar has been set super high, but that doesn't mean you do what the Israelites do and you say, well, how can we adapt this? We have been set apart. You at home have been set apart to be his people, to worship him, to rejoice in what he has done and what he is doing and what he will continue to do. Do not forget the covenant. The promises of God are so full and so rich that we should be rejoicing. We should be striving without any, barely any struggle of saying, I will strive day in and day out to follow what the Lord has asked of me. Remember, it says in 2 Kings, Worship the Lord your God. It is he who will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. God's got this. Any fear that you have, any doubts that you have, any pain that you're experiencing, God knows about it. He understands and he's got you. He's with you. But they didn't listen. And today, that's why I am saying, let's us listen. Let's us make sure that our hearts are turned to God. Our hearts are focused on God. Because in verse 40 and 41, look at the consequences. They would not listen, however, but persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Is there anything more sobering than that to this day? Their ancestors, or their grandchildren, their children, they continued to follow the deceitful, lying ways of the world. The example that these parents made, the example that the elders made in that time, destroyed the history of the nation. There were consequences. And to this day, the choices we make in Impact our family's future. Think about that. The choices that you and I make will either have a good impact or a negative impact. Here's the exciting thing we get to decide. We get to choose who we are going to serve. We get to choose how and what kind of impact we leave in this world when our time on earth is done. Probably more sobering is the second point in that slide you're looking at. The choices we make impact our standing before God. So if it isn't sobering enough to think that the choices I make impact my children, might impact my grandchildren, might impact my great-grandchildren, and the list goes down, the list goes on. If that is not sobering enough, then hear this. The choices you make impact your standing before God. That should spur us on to obedience. That should spur us on with great joy, knowing that we are his children. We are his sheep. He is our shepherd. And we rejoice and we give thanks. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? You know, we still struggle with obedience. And we struggle in, in following God today, don't we? 
This is a world that is, is continually trying to find and, 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 and come up with different ways of, of pushing God out of our society. There's no other way to say it. Of literally pushing God out of every aspect of society. That is our world. And as we are called to be obedient. And we can do that and we can be examples in following God today as individuals. With your families and with your church family. So I want to ask you as we finish up today, how will you protect your heart? What do you have to put in place to protect your heart? Let me personalize it even more. What do you have to do to protect your future generation's hearts? Figure it out and get working on it. God is there and God is willing to walk you through any valley that you have to do and go through to get back in a right standing with him. How will you show your faith and obedience to God? How will you let others know, today I am choosing to serve the Lord? The reality is, is a covenant requires trust and obedience. Do you trust God enough to fill in the blanks, to fill in the unknown? Do you trust God enough to be obedient to his word, to be obedient to his call, and to say, I will let the details take care of themselves because I know God is here? You know, the Israelites didn't trust God enough. They did not care to trust God enough. And as a result, they became captives to all the kings who were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And God had warned them. And they also became captive to the sin in their own lives. Today I ask and I call upon you to make sure that you are taking captive that which is of God, not that which is of the world. So that you can have a legacy that you can share with your kids, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, just what the Lord has done in your life. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage. I pray that as we go through this world where we are inundated by, in every direction, by temptation, by doubt, by sorrow, by pain, that we would remain focused on you. That, Father, our hearts would be tuned to you and you alone. Father, I ask you these things knowing that you are a good God and that you can restore and you can renew broken relationships. You can draw us closer to you. And so, Father, we ask that we as a people, we as individuals, as families, and as a church would continue to strive after you and you alone. And we ask you these things in your glorious and heavenly name. Amen. The next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at some restoration. Daniel, who takes a stand for God. The, 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 the city of Jerusalem that is rebuilt so that people can come back and repent. And finally, in a few weeks' time, the Messiah who is present right in front of the nation's eyes. You see, I'm leaving you in this tension, this captivity today, but we're going to work our way out of it. And we're going to see just what God has done. As you leave this place, go in his name, knowing that he is a good God. Knowing that he is the only God that you were called to serve. We go in his name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today.